Hi, I'm Maria Thea Harris of VeloSoz on social media. Welcome back to Soz 50 podcast on Soul Organized Style. You're listening to the Top 20 Countdown series. And I love that you've got a Sew Over 20 group as well. Then my pride and joy. That's my sewing legacy. Good on you. <laughs> they are my pride and joy. I think of all the things I've done through sewing, that is what I'm most proud of, is seeing them take up sewing and make things and asking Santa for sewing machines for Christmas. That's Jane Wright. Jane was on the podcast in November 2020. She's number 15 in the top 20 countdown. Since 2020, Jane has moved to Margate and she does a mixture of things now. Violin teaching, ceramic art, open water synchronized swimming, and a bit of sewing for herself. Jane made her own wedding dress using a vintage Dior pattern. If you live in the Thanet area, Jane runs a tile making workshop at the Visitor Information Centre. As you can tell, Jane continues to contribute to her local community. A big thank you to you, Jane, for coming back to your Instagram account as well as your account, which is at JAW Ceramics account. Can I encourage you to head over to Jane's Instagram accounts once you've listened to her podcast? Thanks again, Jane, for being on the podcast. Today we're talking to Jane Raven and she started sewing in April 2019. Let's welcome Jane. You've brought the sunshine, which is really lovely. I hope it stays. Jane, welcome to Sell Organised Style podcast for Sew Over 50 Thursday. It's really great that you're here. What's your Instagram name? I've got a sewing Instagram, which is at Janya Raven. And I've got my other one is at Jaw Ceramics. My friends actually hassled me to the point of distraction. I did a lot of pottery. And she said, you must, you must put your pottery on Instagram. And I was like, oh, I can't bother with that. Because I, I wouldn't allow Facebook or anything in the house. And I was like, no, I can't, no. I don't want all that, no, no. And uh, she got on at me for years. And in the end, I kind of like, I did Facebook and I didn't really like it. I was kind of, was kind of intrigued because I kind of like the voyeuristic element of it. <laughs> and kind of like sort of homing in on people's lives. And I did get in touch with some old friends from school, which was wonderful, who I'd lost touch with. And especially people from my travels in New Zealand so and South America. Because that was amazing to reconnect with people who, from like 20, 30 years ago, was amazing. And then she saw like, if you don't Instagram, if you don't know. I just got my girls to put me on Instagram in the end, and originally with Jaw Ceramics. And I, did, I put my gardening, my pottery, my occasional knitting, because that was a new obsession was knitting. And I did Ravelry, but I wouldn't upload anything on Ravelry. I just used to look at everybody else's. And then I started with Instagram because I could see that it was like a photo album. So for me, it was like a visual dream. You didn't have to write anything. You could just put pictures. I joined Instagram purely just so I could. I started up for fun, January Raven, because it was my name spelt badly, which is what the Kiwis did to me. This is so true. The Kiwis, when I was in New Zealand, when I spelt my name, it was, I was like, no, it's Jane with a Y. And they went, oh, Jane. And I was like, yeah, all right, whatever. So, <laughs> so, so it kind of stuck. And then I put Raven because we had plastic ones in the back garden and it was just funny. And so I just used it as an album just for my, my make so I could sort of collate them. And, and then I started getting likes. And, and my friend and I went to India and I bought a knitting magazine. I think I bought Designer, Designer Stitch because I'm obsessive knitter. Everything I do, I do obsessively obsessive knitter I think they bought Love Sewing and there was an article and I just took their magazine read their magazine from front to back and that's how I found out about Sew Over 50. I just turned 50 March 2019. I was born in 1969 and there was an interview April 2019 and I was on my way to India and I was like oh my god I can join this (laughs) (laughs) and it was kind of like I was like, oh, look, this is amazing. I can join this now. And I hadn't actually started sewing. I just thought, oh, I could join this. And I was like, there isn't a knitting one. There isn't a knitting knit over 50. And I'd had a bought really bad sewing attempts in, in the past. Really, I'd try with all my heart to make something for my girls. And it, it was just awful. 
And when they had builder bears, I made a whole builder bear wardrobe. I was, you know, it from everything because I was like, you can't go pay that much for toys, clothes. I'll make it. And so there was all these really bad builder bear clothes, and I made the wardrobe out of cardboard and everything. And you should have seen my girls; they were like, "Oh, mum." I bought a sewing machine, was useless at it. It all went awfully wrong and I put it away. And then I went to the knitting and sewing stitch thing at Earl's Court in London before they knocked it down. And I was going, and I, I, it was mostly sewing. As you know, these things are mostly sewing. There's only a bit of knitting. And I was kind of like, oh, a bit disappointed. I ended up sucked into the Quilters Guild. I mean, I went to a workshop and I had never had as much fun with women about 10 or 15 years older than me I just had such a laugh and they were adorable I had a sense that I could get addicted to that and so I thought nah and I said look this is this has been the best afternoon ever but I think this is something I could get addicted to so I'm going to walk away (laughs) (laughs) because I was knitting already and I'd already got a stash that would last me a lifetime so I was like no I'm going to walk away from this because this could be really treacherous for somebody like me But I've never forgotten them. And every time I go to the stitching show, I just in absolute awe of quilting. I just think it is one of the most incredible art forms. It's so beautiful. I saw Faith Ringgold's exhibition and I was just so moved by her work and Mm. what she stands for. And quilting is something that I admire and I have dabbled. And of course, I made hundreds of quilts at the beginning of lockdown. It was quite fun. I used all my scraps and I really loved it. But I, um, I, I have to be careful with things like that because I get really sort of sucked in. Mm-hmm. My friend was sewing and I was knitting and we had these amazing skill swaps going. So I'd knit and then they'd sew me things. And this is like one of the things that I got out of the swap. It's amazing. I do much better. I said, give me your scraps and I'll try sewing again. And then I, because I saw them persevere and not give in, and because I'd, I then got sort of involved in the Sew Over 50 and because it's such a sharing community of skills and ideas and, and seeing other people make things and, and seeing patterns and just starting to get an understanding of it, I got more into it that way because I could see that and because somebody was prepared to sort of sew with me, I, I kind of got into it that way, kind of quite sort of gently and and I've been sewing a year now and because there's so much on the internet shared YouTube videos and information and patterns and things that work and things that don't and how to do things I absolutely love it and I've unintentionally just started bumping into people remotely on the internet who in Australia and and Holland and and New Zealand and, and it was like wow this is incredible making friends with like-minded people and sharing stories and for something so remote and so abstract it's so wonderfully real like uh, fabric pen pals it is isn't it yeah sewing insta buddies and incredible and not just sort of the posts that you put publicly but then also messaging people and finding out little bits about other people's lives in other parts of the world and making new friends that you may not have met in real life, but you probably know more about those people in some respects than you do people in real life. And you share these interests and are are sort of trying to navigate yourself through a hobby that you may just be learning or some people may know loads about it and they're happy to share. You know, like one of my lovely friends that I've actually met through Server 50 is So With Dye. And like me, she was a design technology teacher. So I kind of know that I know her because I would have worked with somebody like her. I know exactly what she would have been like at school. And so we kind of share also a work knowledge, even though we haven't worked together, we share the same sort of parallel universe in a way. It's fantastic. It's just, it's really exciting. And knitting's quite, it's not solitary. You can actually, it's more portable and you can go around and meet people and knit. And But it takes such a long time. It's not instant. You know, if if you're going to post your knitting post, you might be lucky if you put one in once every three months or something, unless you knit a hat a day. Whereas sewing, you can actually make things at such a rate and and improve your skills quite rapidly and sew along with people. 
knitting along is a full-time project. <laughs> you know, you really sort of have to immerse yourself in, in a part of your life. Whereas at the so long, you can do that. It is more instantaneous and um, more active and really good fun. And so I, I did sort of start getting involved in a few challenges. And through that, I met more and more people. And, and I've won things, which was kind of like, oh my God, I've, I've won something. I was like, you know, I, I think the first thing that, I, I mean, I should have called myself January Remnant, really, because I'm, I'm terrible for finding scraps of fabric and being determined to make something out of them. Living in London, we have a real problem with fly tipping. We have a problem with guilt cycling and just dumping stuff everywhere. It's like, I don't have space for it here, so I'll leave it in the street. So I, I kind of regularly find fabric dumped in the street. Denim, jeans, loads of notions. I mean, I don't think, I do buy buttons from my favourite shop, but I get zips, buttons, those um, D-rings, all sorts of things. Just, just on the street? Yeah, just on the street. And especially during lockdown, when, when charity shops were closed. So there's literally, I mean, I was going to do, I was going to start taking photographs of all the stuff that I find dumped in the street. But then I kind of thought, well, I can't really do that because unfortunately, because sometimes I'm on my way to work, mm. I can't always pick it up and take it somewhere. So I thought, no, because that, that's, that's kind of not right, really. You know, I mean, yes, I'm highlighting, but it's not. I found seven denim shirts when I went to Hearn Bay to the seaside and I rehoused all those to my little sew over 20s. Yeah, I made a denim dress out of jeans I found dumped near a portaloo just, just across the road and I won I won a competition with that I was kind of I won fro, so frugal 19 and it was like wow look what I've done I've what you know and and I made friends with the people who didn't win that like one of my really good friends frugalissima Sam who's from the north of England like me we became really good friends she was like I can't believe it you've just started making things and you've won that <laughs> I, was just, I just absolutely just fell in love with the Insta buddies I was making through sewing. And yeah, and just done in such a short space of time, have done lots and lots of really interesting things. So over 50 is incredible. It's such a lovely community that is so welcoming, is not afraid to express things. And I love it when people actually are quite honest as well. When you invite people to be honest, yes, and they are, it's yeah. just priceless. I absolutely love that. You know, we say this is really bad, and they go, "Yeah, it is actually." And and I and I really love that. You know, I can't, um, because when you're making things at home on your own, your family aren't really that interested. They can, oh, mum's made something else. But you put it on, on Instagram to your sewing community and you get loads of amazing feedback from people who are genuinely interested. They've made that themselves or they like how you've done it or the fabric. And it's the discussions that you don't have around you. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, this is what I, this is what I want. I, you know, I want this kind of evaluating what you've done. Because that's what it really is. It's not just compliments. It's, oh, I did that, but I did it in this or... I've used this or, and that for me is what I really love because I want to get better at it. So it's kind of like sort of being at school, but, or college, it's that kind of environment where you're sharing your makes and your things that work and things that don't, if you're brave enough. (laughs) I've been thinking about what I was going to talk to you about. I have actually thought about it because I thought, why, why do I sew and why have I got so involved in it? And There's so many reasons why. And and another reason is because I've got two daughters who are 19 and 22 and they are gorgeous. And I found that they were stealing all my clothes from the 90s that I can't wear anymore because they just don't look good at all. And I used to shop in the shops that they shop in. And I thought, "Hmm, can't do that. When I went on the high street, I realized there was a new uniform for me to move into, like a new series of shops designed for my age group and I was kind of like I'm not doing that and I went in one of the shops with it's called white stuff and I went in in posh Boswell Hill with my eldest daughter and she went oh mum we're not we're not staying in here it's making me feel old no no, mum you're not she she pulled me out and I was kind of like but there's no shops left for me anymore you know Millie and that's when I realized that you could choose your own fabrics because with knitting, I was choosing quality yarn and materials. So I was choosing wool and 
sadly possum, but let's not go there because it's too embarrassing. All sorts of things that were natural, no more acrylic, or polyester, or my knitwear was going into a whole new echelon of luxury. And yet I found that I actually am allergic to polyester. It makes me really hot. And so it's not allergic, but I have a reaction to it. I get really kind of really hot. And it's not even, you know, menopause hot. It's like I'm overheating. And I realized that when I started looking at my clothes labels, I wasn't happy about the labor that was being used to make them and the disposable element of them um, and the fact that they weren't made to last. But I was also not happy about the fact that the materials that they used, and you can buy cotton jersey, you can buy 98% denim, you can make things with hem so that you can let them in and let them out. You can cut things really well. I have a, a sticky out bum. So, you know, you can sort of design clothes that fit you and work on your body and don't make you look awful. And also you can make things that fit you, not you trying to fit into the clothes, which I think is something that, you know, all age groups, we all fall into that. We try and fit into clothes rather than clothes fitting us. And we try and fit into the fashion and the style rather than a style or a fashion that looks good on us. So we get sort of sucked into that. One of the things that I started with my eldest daughter's friends, because I, I, they've all grown up in our house. It's been like a teen crash around here. When I started sewing, they were like, oh, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to do that. So I said, well, look, come on, we'll, we'll do it. We'll get together and we'll, we'll make things. So for fun, we started so over 20 and they're amazing. And it's, it's young women and young men, my daughter's social circle, they've started making things. And when we sat together and we did all the measurements and looking at what kind of clothes we wanted to make and shapes and things like this, what we realized was that how they felt about their bodies. And there are people within that social circle who've had problems with eating. So what we did find, with, you know, was that how we're made to feel about our bodies and the, the sort of body dysmorphia that's sort of imposed upon us, really, that we're not the right shape and we should be this shape or that yeah. shape, was not peculiar to any age group. Whatever's being fed into us spans all the age groups. And we all sat around and we, we did our measurements and our measurements were all quite similar. We were all different shapes. And we had these amazing conversations and what I found working with them, and this is men as well, who also suffer from the same thing, if you like, what I found from them was actually when you start making your own clothes, you start to feel better about your body and your shape, especially when you're working with other people doing that and you're sharing what you make and what looks good on you. And you start taking back some control and being more empowered about how you want to look and what colors you want to wear and what fabrics and what shapes. And it happens so gradually, but at the same time, it's kind of like this big epiphany that I'm not going to go out and be told what to wear. I'm going to choose what I want to wear and make it and feel good in it. And it's just watching the sew of the 20s when they've made something, like my daughter made these jeans and she was like, look at what I, you know, and it was completely different from buying jeans. Buying jeans is the worst experience in the world. Most people, buying jeans is traumatic, trying them on and all the mirrors. And I think we kind of think it's our, us as we get older or, you know, we've had children in our bodies and, but the young suffer from it too. Mm. And they're perfect. Their bodies are perfect. I think it's been a huge thing for me the whole sewing and sewing with other people especially younger people and when I make things that don't fit me I just pass them on to them you know like if, when I'm determined to make another shift dress that I know is going to look awful on me <laughs> here you go Alex <laughs> we're not different measurements just different shapes and therefore she looks stunning in it and so it's been amazing to explore a hobby that actually I think has taught me a lot about myself and how I feel about myself. It also sounds like since April 2019, you've become obsessed with sewing. You've been able to figure out what works for you. You've been able to share that with the Sew Over 20s and also make sure that you're reusing and recycling where you can because that's what's happening in your 
current environment? Because I use my pocket money to do my hobbies. I try and source my things, some from waste, but when I'm buying new things, I try and wherever possible use local fabric shops in London here or with my yarn, I always try and buy things from Yorkshire where I'm from or New Zealand, which has a big connection with Yorkshire. There's a huge connection with the textile industry. So I try and support companies that are local or sort of some connection to me. So with fabrics, I try really hard to buy dead stock or remnants in the basket. I'm really lucky. There's the guy, my, my lovely friend, Mr. Hyatt's got the most amazing remnant basket for 50p. And I also try and clothes that, you know, are, are being thrown out. I try and if they're not going to the charity shop to be resold or reused in that way, I try and take the notions off them and stuff like that. And I hope it's having a bit of an impact on my daughters. I think they're getting more aware of disposable fashion. And I think they're much more aware and they're sharing a lot more clothes. I've noticed that they, they put stuff on their Snapchat. Does anybody want this? And so I'm, I'm kind of hoping that my kind of obsession with yes okay you've cleared out your wardrobe but that's not the end of it where's it going now charity shop okay so even though it's gone to the charity shop it still is your responsibility it's still your stuff if that ends up in a landfill in uganda you are responsible for that mm. so i see that as my my duty to make a big fuss about that because i think it's really important you know we it's just easy for us to buy things because i've made quite a lot of things in a year I've started to become a little bit more mindful now over what I'm making and the speed of which I can make things because people keep saying how fast I am. They, they forget I've come from the land of knitting, which, <laughs> which is super slow. <laughs> and also I was a woodwork teacher. If you take an advanced knitter and a woodwork teacher and show them a sewing machine and fabric and scissors, once you start being braver, it's the same. You just try knit those skills together you and you just transfer it and yeah you're fast because a sewing machine is nothing compared to a circular saw or and because I used to teach woodwork measuring and cutting wood well fabric's a doddle you know it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's so yes I'm fast but one of the things that I, I kind of I have to set myself challenges all the time now for me it's, I want to get finesse I've been looking at fit. I've become obsessed by fit. I'm looking at fit. I've been looking at how you alter patterns because I've done a few pattern tests now, which I really enjoy because I've learned so much from doing the pattern tests about how you make things fit. And I, and I want things to look as good inside as outside now. Yeah. So not just quickly running things up, but I want them to be really beautiful because my knitting is, I will literally take something back if I've done a stitch wrong and knit it all again. It's not as easy to do that with sewing when something goes wrong. It's like cutting your fringe and you have to wait for it to grow or, or it's just, but you know, once you've cut something wrong or sewn it wrong, it's so much harder than knitting. Knitting, you can do it all again. So, but I kind of want to, I kind of want to have that, like when I was teaching woodwork, kids would come to me and say, you know, is this sanded enough, miss? And I go, if you're asking me, it's not. I'm going to go away then. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of want to have the same, and it's the same with my violin teaching. It's just, you know, that's not good enough. So I kind of want to put the same thing into my sewing. Sewing is an art form that you can do so quickly and it can look okay. And you can get away with it not being finesse. But I, I've been sort of looking at Dior and Alexandra McQueen and the tailoring and, and the cuts. And I kind of think, yeah, that's what I want to be able to do. I want to make things that are just beautiful. And I know they're beautiful, even if nobody else notices. At the moment I connected with So So Leaf and I love that she posts all the details of her work. And I kind of think, yeah, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to go, look, okay got that stitch exactly in the right place I think <laughs> that's where I want to move next and I want to you know that it fits perfectly and it and it looks great on whoever I'm making it for that's the direction I want to go in next I kind of feel like I've explored lots of avenues of sewing I haven't done underwear and I'm not sure I want to and I don't want to do sportswear 
but I, I kind of think I've done lots of, made lots of things like, you know, ticked lots of boxes, but now I want to do it really well. You've ticked a lot of boxes in one year. I know. <laughs> so many boxes. And you know that there's another challenge on this month with Sober 50, don't you? The So Small Shops. It's hashtag So 50 Shop Small Business. I've already done that. I did that. Ah. I did <laughs> I, I'm, I'm 51 now. I know, I know what I'm like. I'm kind of okay with it. <laughs> but one of my first Insta buddy, vintage Tina, who is the most lovely lady in yes. a hot part of Australia where they can grow mangoes. Tina and a lovely lady in Holland called Christine Stein makes, we set up the sewing resistance, which was an opportunity for people to express themselves through textiles which I think a lot of people do. It, it became quite obvious to me that I wasn't the only person who didn't like Facebook because they didn't want to write about things or harp on about what their opinions were or Twitter. But actually, I think a lot of people do actually make things as an escape or as yeah. a way of expressing themselves. And so the three of us set up the zone resistance as a means to do that, as a means to... I went to an exhibition about Chile and I learned about the apieras, which are these patchworks from the 70s, where during the time of dictatorship, the Chilean women used patchwork and embroidery as a way of getting information out of Chile as to okay. what was happening there. And it spread all around the world. People like Pete Seeger were involved in spreading and, and, and one of my friends from orchestra, I was telling her about this because she's an anthropologist and she went, I have one of those. She said, I bought it when I was at university in Leeds in the 70s. I've got one. I was like, no way. She goes, I have. And so I realized what a powerful medium textiles is. And seeing artists like Faith Ringgold, Grayson Perry is another, who choose to use, and the quilts, of course, the amazing quilts that are exhibited. Geez, Ben quilts is an amazing example who choose to use textiles as their mode of communication, their mode of their, their art canvas to express ideas and thoughts and, and concerns or hopes and dreams and all sorts of things. So many hopes and dreams are in quilts. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, and stories. And so, yeah, um, Chrissy, Tina and I set up the sewing resistance and just as a kind of a, a, a way of, of, sort of exploring how people use textiles to talk, to communicate. Well, Christy and I got involved in So Unconventional, which is a completely other story. Christine and I, through the VE Day, the 75 years of liberation in Europe, we made the Dutch liberation skirts. And I'm in a museum in Amsterdam. <laughs> because that was such a beautiful way that women expressed themselves through their clothing and and I, and I taught Christine the word immersed <laughs> and it became her favorite word because I'm Spanish speaking but Christine and I would use Google a lot to translate and we'd have such a laugh translating between Dutch and English and then occasionally I'd teach her words and her favorite word became immersed because both Christine and I like to be immersed into things and which is a lovely way of saying obsessive behavior. <laughs> just don't do things by half. You just completely dive into it and, and explore it and hopefully not exhaust something, but keep looking at where you can go next with it. That's where I'm at the moment. And yeah, it's a lot. When I wrote it down on a piece of paper, I was like, Oh my God, that's a lot in a year. That's probably not very normal. <laughs> but... It's a lot in a year. There's nothing wrong with that. And you've got a goal for the following year. So that's wonderful. And like you said, you've already done your challenge piece for So 50 Shops Small Business and tagged it with that plus So Over 50, right? For sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's running this month for So Over 50. I love the challenges that, uh, I mean, for me, that, that challenge ticks all the boxes because you have to sort of think when you're on Instagram, you know, because you can get so sucked into the getting more followers and all the rest of it. Yes. And I kind of thought, you know, what am I in it for? Especially with social media, because you become a product so easily of social media. And I kind of thought, what am I in it for? Because I didn't even want to be in it to begin with. You know, I was so suspicious of it all. 
and of course I've watched the documentaries about social media and, and how it's used and, and data collecting and things like that. And I kind of thought, well, hopefully, you know, with the whole follower thing, it's quality, not quantity. Yeah. If you have 60 followers, but they're quality, then that's got what it's got to be about. It's not got to be about collecting and a popularity thing. It has to be about connecting with those people in some way. I think the reason why I like challenges is I like to think, and I'm probably wrong, but I kind of like to think that I might be just upsetting the algorithm a little bit. That's what I hope. I'm not sure how successful in my little fantasy world (laughs) I'm beating the system. I kind of hope that's why, but I also, I like to enter some of the challenges. The ones that don't promote big businesses, but the ones that hopefully introduce you to other people that you might bump into somebody who's like-minded. And that's why the So Unconventional, Christine and I did that together. And we, we thought we were like, I think our mindset, well, Christine was, for example, crocheting with videotape. I was making a man's suit, which was a skirt and a jacket out of tarpaulin. So that for me was unconventional. But both Christy and I were very mindful of our materials, our yeah. resources. We were making things that probably wouldn't be worn. So we wanted to question things with it, like more like an art piece, like why don't men wear skirts when they look amazing in them? And tarpaulin is a plastic fabric that's woven. It's actually a fabric that's woven from plastic that ends up in landfill. So I, I went around the streets and found tarpaulins and found. Found in inverted commas, yes. Actually, I got a couple from the allotment. And she went to... Um, charity shops and got videotapes and cassette tapes that were just disposed really in charity shops they were just again guilt cycled there so we were there diligently trying to raise awareness I suppose in our little world of waste and landfill meanwhile over in the states they were just going out buying plastic to make their runway type outfits and we were like oh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but because we would sort of started this challenge we were determined to see it through to the end but we learned a lot from it but I think most of all the conversations that Chrissy and I had behind the scenes messaging each other away you know in our beds um, I mean we were up to all sorts of hours in the morning just giggling at uh, some of the things and things like that are priceless those sort of connections with people are absolutely priceless and I mean some of the things I, I've kept some of the messages because I just laughed so much you know like you know when you translate Dutch and English it's so funny um, and so we, we were just in absolute hoots about what we were doing and Mary Wilson was one of the cassettes that Chrissy used for her make and my friend actually knows Mary Wilson she lives near here so I was like, oh my God, that's my friend. She's, she's my friend's friend. She goes, her daughter goes to dance with my girl. I was like, what? <laughs> so so, so she, she kind of like made her jacket out of a song. That's incredible, you know. But yeah, we were on a completely different level with the people doing so unconventional in the States. So we kind of had our own little contest. But what was really nice was even though we were doing it in a completely different way Uh, we were never going to win but we did actually meet people um you know that we connected with people through that challenge which was incredible you know really amazing and also it opened my eyes as well the organizers were racially attacked and that was a real eye-opener to me you know think that things like that would happen so i think if you get involved in these kind of things you can learn a little bit more about different parts of the world and the politics in different parts of the world. I mean, quite frankly, when I wanted to know about the, the fires in Australia, I just asked Tina and Tony, say what, what's happening? You know, <laughs> what's actually happening? How many pouches have you actually made? So you, you kind of get a chance to find out what's really happening. You get that through the connections of the people that you meet on Instagram through Sober 50 and groups like that. So I kind of feel in a tiny way that by sharing, it's a bit like when I'm at the allotment, you know, you can talk to people because you know, at the end of the day, no matter what you agree or disagree on, you like gardening. You're never going to argue about that. And I think it's the same with sewing or any sort of hobby you share or interest you share or 
or pastime or or even you know and it's different from work it's different it's amazing isn't it really (laughs) and I think we're gonna have to leave it there Jane that enough (laughs) that's heaps it was a really good thought piece on your part and talking about landfill and understanding the impact of what waste does clothing that's left out or things that are thrown away you are still responsible for what happens to that so I'm really pleased that you brought those ideas to the podcast because I know that other people are thinking exactly the same thing and I love that you've got a sew over 20 group as well they're my pride and joy that's my sewing legacy (laughs) good on you they are my pride and joy I think of all the things I've done through sewing that is what I'm most proud of is seeing them take up sewing and make things and asking Santa for sewing machines for Christmas that is incredible and the fact that it's not just females it's men as well young men as well who are making things and see it as a really good hobby and form of organizing mental health as well you know yeah you've hit the nail on the head you really have you know especially under our current sort of restrictions it was really lovely when Julian took the sewing machine up to Leeds in the van and I was just kind of like I mean he hasn't used it yet but that doesn't matter it's the fact that he's sending me messages about I haven't been you know I've been away from the machine and I'd quite like to get back into it and so yeah it's it's really good that they they found an outlet I think because making things is a way of expressing yourself when you have opinions or you have ideas or you have hopes and dreams but you might want to express it in a different way Yeah, you might not be able to articulate it, but you can show it in a different way. Or sometimes you may have opinions, but you might not be confident about sharing them. You know, a lot of us have strong opinions and ideas or things that we'd like to see change or things that we wish didn't happen. And we might not always want to express them through words or, you know, some of us do it through actions or making things. You know, lots of people do it in different ways. It can be working in food banks rather than you know, so lots of people do things that are quite small and may seem insignificant, but actually it's not always a case of who shouts loudest or who makes the most. <laughs> <laughs> you shall see finesse. <laughs> yeah, I've just picked up this dress, this Dior dress that I, that I started making. And uh, I remember Tina said to me, but what does it look like inside? And it's going to look amazing. <laughs> I said, challenge that it's going to look good inside. Jane, thank you so much for coming on to So Over 50's podcast on So Organised Style. You've taken us through your journey, not just of the sewing that you've done, you know, in the last 12 months, but in how you approach it and how you have approached Instagram too. I just want to thank everybody who, everybody in the sewing community who's taken the time to connect in any way because it's meant so much to me. It really has. There you go, listeners. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you from Jane and thank you from me for everyone who's been listening to So Organized Style Podcast. This episode of So 50 Podcast on So Organized Style was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Jane, sound by bensound.com. Many thanks for the ongoing support of the podcast Patreon contributors. On patreon.com forward slash so organized style, you can support this podcast every month for the cost of a coffee. Their ongoing support enables me to develop this podcast for free. You can subscribe to Soul and I Style Podcast, but with an S not a Z on all good podcast apps. Make sure you go back and listen to our free Sub 50 Podcast archive on Soul and I Style Podcast. If you would like to contribute to the many ongoing posts and challenges the team promotes on the Sub 50 account on Instagram, direct message Sandy and the editorial team. The Sober 50 community has over 50,000 followers. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone.